So I'm Sandro Catanzaro. I am a co-founder, chief innovation officer for DataZoo. Um, DataZoo, what we have done is we have automated uh, the scientific method for marketing, running experiments, and using those experiments to run the platform. The question is whether programmatic TV is dead. Is this a revolution or an evolution? And uh, the challenge is uh, buyers want to believe, and buyers um, have interest in this working. However, they are also skeptic. Uh, in more than one presentation, I have had somebody raising their hand and say, actually, does it exist? Or is it just storytelling? So programmatic TV is going to exist as long as we actually execute real programmatic TV. We execute, we create real analytics out of, uh, out of these, these, these campaigns we run, and we also deliver on results. Now, um, for this to work, uh, there is a few challenges we need to actually conquer. One is the role of currency, especially in connected TV. Uh, we used to have Nielsen, and for, broad, for broadcast, that was okay, and was the way we actually transacted. Now, with connected TV coming, coming on board, we, we need to work to kind of create uh, a good currency. Second challenge is uh, better automation and standards for automation that enable us to transact easier. And uh, again, avoid the fax, the phone call, the email. Just use the systems to talk to each other. And the third one is the um, resurgence of uh, closed ecosystems, closed wall gardens, closed siloed environments. So these three things are things we need to kind of think through and see how they're going to affect uh, uh, the future of programmatic TV. So without further ado, this is a luxury panel. I'm going to introduce uh, you guys. Uh, Dana Versano, Senior Vice President and Innovation and Programmatic Solution for Turner. Um, Julian Silverbrand, uh, Executive Vice President for Audience Science at Viacom. Chris Wilson, uh, Executive Vice President for National Television for Comsco. Then we have Stephen Kaufman, uh, Managing Director of Programmatic uh, for Acuen OMD USA. And last but not least, Jeff Muir, uh, Vice President of Programmatic at Sales for Audience Express. So, um, what is programmatic TV precisely? Is it alive? Does it need to be biddable? Does it need to be impression level? Um, Julian, do you want to take it? Uh, sure. Uh, first, since I thought we were talking baseball. Uh, <laughs> my bad on that. After my beloved Mets uh, were eliminated, uh, I started rooting for Cleveland, so I expect my mic levels to be awesome. <laughs> um, what is programmatic TV? Uh, planning with hamsters on the wheel on the back end? Um, realistically, it's planning. And now, if you're talking about what the promise of it is, then in promise, it should be impression level. Uh, and in promise, it should be obviously data driven um, and to some extent DAI, right? So that's the promise of it. I don't know that, that we're functionally there today. Uh, and there are lots of challenges and intrinsic um, complexity to the television space that I think a lot of people who come from digital, and I spent 12 years at an agency and a lot, most of it on the digital side, um, the, a lot of people who come from digital backgrounds expect TV to work like digital without understanding the actual infrastructure of how TV is delivered, and it's nowhere near the same, and it's going to be a very long time till it's even a semblance of that. Uh, and so the promise of it versus what it is today and what people like to uh, put in the press or what somebody likes to write an article about is very, very different. Is there value on what we have today versus not having it? Um, I think there's always value if you can plan smarter. So, um, you know, contrary to uh, what most people think because I work at Viacom, I'm technically a buyer at Viacom. And I spend most of my time actually doing consumer marketing on behalf of our brands, so I still function and act like an agency person. Um, there's always value in doing uh, intelligent planning, and so th absolutely there's a value there, but um, I think without, uh, you know, without really understanding the depth of and the complexity of execution and what your limitations are, as well as what you can actually transact on, as well as what you can confirm, so my KPI is tune-in, um, and if I'm running you know, programmatic in certain environments, I'm not necessarily gonna get uh, the metrics that I want in every environment effectively, equally. 
Uh, I might get you know, certain things from Dish and Direct that I'm not going to get from Comcast or Time Warner and so on and so forth. So uh, it's certainly better than not having uh, the ability to plan with data, uh, but it's certainly not what I think people make it out to be. Thank you. Jeff, I please. I want to just say, you know, when we talk about television, we're talking about a huge ecosystem. So um, there are some places where it has been automated to some degree. Um, you know, companies like uh, a wide orbit that have, uh, you know, had a backbone and infrastructure that they've built upon. Company like ours that originally, um, you know, Google TV ads utilized us uh, uh, back in the day when they were doing it. And there were some other companies like Vidya that are trying to build it from and have built it from the ground up. You know, so that's kind of where, um, you know, maybe a little bit of the, the easier job was to do. Um, I think Arun had said it most recently um, from Magna in the trades when he said, you know, you know, doing this is difficult. You know, if it was easy, it would be done. Um, I also find, um, and there was a Forrester analyst that, that communicated that he thought that uh, programmatic would come in, in a way that was pragmatic. And I think that's what we're seeing. You know, I think the revolutionary aspect, you know, because the, the, the evolution versus revolution, uh, I think the revolutionary aspect when we talk about programmatic um, or any kind of automated is the fact that, you know, television started to use audience buying in its discussions. I mean, up until you know, X amount of years ago, Asian gender only, that's where we're at. So I think, for me, that was the revolutionary point. You know, and evolution, by definition, is slow and takes time. So um, we are in, you know, to use any kind of baseball vernacular, first inning, second inning, first pitch of the first inning. It's betting on where you are in that ecosystem um, and where you are in terms of having to build out the technology I think that's where we find ourselves today. I think the challenge is, and I think what people don't understand, and I, I think you bring up a, a good point, is out of the pool of available inventory, that pool that's automated by yourselves or others is, what would you say, average? 5%, 10%? Yep, right? small number. So you have this large pool of inventory that everybody wants. Correct. That is not. That's, that's, I think, where people just don't understand how it works. Correct. So, so one, one of the things that confuses me most about this space is, and you just heard it here, right? We're talking about programmatic, we're talking about probably six, seven different things, right? So the idea of programmatic is automation um, in TV. I, I don't know that that's necessarily where we have to or need to go right now, right? And the reason I would say that is TV is, <coughs> and Julian, tell me if you disagree with this, but it's a really efficient way to buy and sell inventory, Agreed. right? What other industry? You know, I, I first started at Tuner in 2012, 72 hours, 72 hours, billions of dollars on the phone, 3 a.m., not a piece of paper. That transaction did not need to be automated. Yes. Right? Now, now, what I would say the pivot here is you do make sacrifices because of how streamlined that, that process is, right? And the biggest sacrifice you make is you can't leverage data and analytics the right way. So, so whereas programmatic grew up in, in digital as a means to, um, to aggregate long tail, to make a transaction that, that was very, very laborsome and cumbersome across 57 different partners to make that automated and streamlined and easy, in TV, it has to be about data and analytics first. Because the transaction today in TV, really, really, really simple, really straightforward, right? It, it is easy to buy and sell television in bulk and, and do it at speed. Again, we don't have data and analytics in that process, so that's what we sacrificed. Right, but and we, when we buy that way, the way you describe, you know, phone call and we just do the business. And we, coming back to your point on data and analytics and audiences, and we buy a lot of spillover. Sure, you're investing the money. <clears throat> but is that the best investment? And I want to kind of absolutely not. I, I want to see if uh, Stephen can it depends you, what your goal is. Your perspective on the agency. That's from the the it depends what your goal is. <laughs> it's bulk impressions and PRPs. Yes. Yeah. That's going to work really well. It's going to work really well. <laughs> but part of the part of the problem is right is we're getting hung up on terminology, right? That's really what programmatic in TV is very different than programmatic in digital, and we have we happen to think a lot of people get confused about the differences between those two, right? It's 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 just a Programmatic and TV is just TV, it's just a different way of looking at TV, right? Um, and you know, I think to Dan's point, the technology and the information assets available today, and the ability to leverage them to look at ways to effectively optimize television planning and buying, whether it's linear, whether it's VOD, whether it's addressable, it's, those are just delivery platforms, right? Optimizing across that, the, the technology and the information available today to do that brings those worlds closer together, and I think there's a lot of confusion that gets Agreed. created. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think forget, forget programmatic, right? right? So, you know, forget the terms. Terrible point, term. Right? It's, <laughs> it's data-driven audience buying. Right. 
right? That, at the end of the day, that, that's what we want. We want to use data to buy you, not you, maybe you, I'm not sure about you, I want to pay a different price for you, right? That's, that's, what, that's what I do all day, right? How do we bring that science to, to the mass media, right? Now, as, as we said earlier, billions of dollars transacted in the 72-hour time period, right? So the people taking those billions of dollars, I'm not so sure they want this world to change. Right? So don't rock their boat because things are good. Right? And then, hate to say it, but on the agency side, and I sit on the agency side, we make a lot of money taking those billions of dollars and, and buying that TV. Right? So do we really want the world to change? You know, we say we do, but you know, and ultimately the advertisers have formulas for how they plan their media, and they know 85 GRPs a week gets them this, and when they increase to 115 GRPs a week, it gets them that. Do they really want those billions of dollars to change? Right? So you, know, you talk about evolution. Are we stifling the evolution? Because the, the, the technology, it, 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 I'd argue that it's, it's closer to there than, than a lot of people are letting on, right? I mean, if, if Dish and DirecTV can do household addressable, then the technology is certainly there, right? Digital cable, you know, the ability to, to serve to a set-top box, it's there, right? But so what's the holdup? So, but there is not really too much new in what you described, right? It's hitting the right audience. And that was even done before there was any programmatic TV wording, I mean, you know, 90s. But, but TV 70s. measurement was not built to do that originally. But you still could go get the ratings for a certain audience. Sure, it was demographic, but you could get the ratings and you could buy certain shows. I, I think somebody said it uh, before, I, I think, on the first panel, which is the, the question is not necessarily like using data, it's what data you're using. And clients are getting a lot more sophisticated right. about how they're aggregating their own data and because I'm getting more sophisticated about aggregating my data, then to put that data to use, right, I have a very different tactic I might use for my first party audience, somebody that already per, you know, uh, peruses my programming, and I have a message I want to deliver them, or I know what, you know what they're watching and I want to deliver certain things. And if they're not in my set, then I have a different message that I want to deliver in a different experience. And I don't so, want to pay oh, the same price. Very much, right, correct. And so, you know, but I don't know that most TV will be biddable. I know, I know he doesn't, and I know I don't ever plan on making any of that inventory <laughs> biddable, right? Not, I'll, right. I'll, I'll but you, you, might, you might pay flat rates or whatever it is. Right, Higher correct. Rate, well, right, you might it value it at whatever it is. Right. But I think that's the key, is, is that the, the ability to use specific sets of data and people getting more sophisticated about how they're aggregating it and then how they're putting it to use. And that's what the promise or the idea of quote unquote programmatic, and I, I, I agree to throw that term out when it comes to TV, and it's really data-driven buying. And right. I know, obviously, we do. I know Turner does, and there are a few others that have data-driven, you know, solutions that they offer that are actually quite robust and quite sophisticated. Uh, very much in partnership with Chris and, and his organization, um, which you know don't function in a programmatic manner, right. but serve the same purpose. The difference now is scale, the scale of information, right? Because that's what didn't exist before. And without scale, a lot of the analytics and the insights and the optimizations, the audience-based buying for TV, all those things don't exist, right? And, um, you know, that's the, been the big shift. You know, age sex is just a target. It's a pretty broad target, but it's just a target. If you are able to get in-market auto consumers and you're Nissan, that's what you want, right? If you're running for president, you want persuadable voters. And being able to leverage information, understand, how to most efficiently reach those people um, is what's key. And, and the technology and the information available today allows for that, so these systems are starting to get developed. Yeah, and the one, one thing I would add to that is there, there's a precision piece here that, that's really, really important, right? So on one end of that spectrum, you have you know, full addressability, right? And it's what you can do right. in certain pockets of inventory today. The other end of the spectrum, I would say, you kind of have the way that 90 to 95 percent of the inventory today is still bought, which is typically in big rotators. Even if you're buying program, you're buying season long, right? There's a lot of runway in between there, right? And that's sort of what we've been pushing towards, and, and, and that's that's what Viacom's been pushing towards as well. You know, I, I think the the idea that we need addressability to solve these problems, I can tell you right now, there's probably 30 to 60 percent efficiency on the cutting room floor, yep. just in how you activate in non-addressable TV today. 
Agreed. We've seen it in every deal that we do. It's why we've built the solutions that, that Julian referenced before. It's because functionally we can get you a much, much higher composition of the audiences you care about most, right? We have better data than we've ever had before. We have great analytics to find those audiences, right? right. This is where predictive analytics are key in a non-addressable world, right? You're still buying this unit, this 30 second spot. Predictive analytics give us lots of metadata about who's gonna be tuning into that spot. And we can use that data and those analytics, again, to get you a hell of a lot closer without being all the way from, from an addressability standpoint. 100 percent Thank you very much. So I have another question for you guys. Um, we were talking at the beginning, uh, lots of consumers are actually driving this move towards streaming media, right? And so in that sense, some of the conversation we're having now is actually going to be a moot point maybe 10, 20 years from now. Everything was going to be streamed. To that, what do we think is going to be the currency for measuring this type of media? Is it going to be uh, Nielsen? Is it going to be Comscore? Well, it'll be Comscore. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, so you before, can ask that question. I mean, we can, well, well, that problem solved. Oh, All right, let's go. So what's the next question? Next question. Sorry. Or is it going to be a, 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 a NAT server? Uh, honestly, I think it'll be a mix. Um, Ad server to some degree, just for kind of a delivery mechanism. Uh, you know, uh, certainly Comscore will be involved. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't think that it will be one solution. Uh, and again, being on the agency side for as long as I was, um, I don't think that any one solution actually makes sense in the, the quote unquote digital addressable world. I think you're gonna have lots of different evaluations of you know, how did you get to, what's the methodology? How did you get to those numbers? What are you charging me for those numbers? How does all of that work? Uh, how much confidence do I have in the solution? Um, and, and again, you know, the methodology that you get to it, I don't envision in 20 years that it would be one metric like it was, you know, for the past 75. Yeah, Comscore, Comscore provides a really valuable um, service in the digital world, right? So there is the ad server, you guys actually say, whether the audience is the right audience. and Right, but if you look at it audience. in the digital world, it's very, very different, right? My, my point is in TV, it may happen the same. You still count the ads as they were delivered, they were seen, but whether it's within or without outside the audience, maybe something yeah. that, you in, know. In and outside the audience, though, it'll, it'll be the 20 year from now version of a DMP, right? Because when we look at what we measure online, Comscore and Nielsen can only measure that same thing, age, age and, uh, and gender. So when we look at the more complex data sets that we're working with, lights and non-TV viewers, for example, Right, that's not something that Comscore or Nielsen can currently verify. Now, maybe, maybe that that like to have you time viewers. Mm -hmm. So I would say that we can. I mean, we, we're doing that now. I mean, it's not part of a VCE verified audience currently. Right. So that being, that's got to evolve. So currently, we use our DMPs for that or more granular first-party data. So ultimately, you know, the ad server was just gross impressions. But then, you know, think about a GRP and a TRP. Right. The TRP, when we look at specific online measurement right now comes from our DMP. So right, that's to, that, to that point, we should talk later. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're, we've actually, we're All rolling out a product called VCE Plus, which is exactly that for that exact reason, which is to, to verify those audiences beyond the, the broad demand. I mean, but look, let, let, let's take a step back. If you look at the digital ecosystem, I have my ad server that delivers the unit, which technically, in a digital world, kind of what I pay on to some degree in certain inventory set. Then I might have a VCE or a DAR, Right, that's one level. Then I have a verification tool that's verifying, you know, and don't, don't, any, don't get confused. Like in 20 years, if you don't think that there are gonna be bots in a digital driven world, in TV as well, fooling yourselves. Like that's gonna exist there too. Sure. So you're gonna have all these other kind of tools that are part of the trade, right? And then what the currency is. Mm -hmm. The currency is very, very different than everything used to measure it. So I don't know that one system is a currency, uh, in that world. Nor should it be the goal. Nor should it be, yeah. potentially. And it doesn't, it doesn't need to be in many cases, Correct. right? Because it's just a different model. In TV, that's not the case. Correct. Hold, hold on, so, so just let's just back up for one second, right? So the premise that there is going to be some level of uniformity in terms of, of how, how an ad is placed in front of a viewer, and when I say a viewer, I mean all 300 plus million of them here in the United States in 20 years, right? That, that's not gonna happen, right? There's gonna be some amalgamation constantly. Right, because just as we solve for one technology, there's another technology and another and another and another. So to some extent, there, there will always be the need for um, third party entities that help us better measure and qualify viewership, um, however you want to define that. Now, what I do think is going to be different and what's really good for Chris's business and probably bad for, for Nielsen's business is the days of having one person who, do, who does that. Correct. Gone. 
Yeah. It's gone today, right? It, it's already happened. It, it's gone, right? So, gone. so we've been, you know, at Turner, we've been very open about this, about our vision, and I think, um, you know, you know, Julian and the folks of ICOM, I think it's they, they share a, a similar point of view on this. But there is a world that we're in right now that's going to continue to expand, where you're going to have multiple currencies. But it will still be a currency in the sense that if you have an advertiser who comes to us and says, I want to transact on my first party data stitched on top of, of Chris's set-top box data, we need to be able to do business on that. It needs Correct. to be third-party verified. We need to control for things like UE stability and a whole slew of other projection issues. They should do the same thing at Viacom, same thing at Turner, and I've created a single currency for that one advertiser. Next advertiser comes in, they want to use Nielsen and Catalina data. Great. That's the difference. You're going to have multiple currencies. Yes. The trick is going to be creating consistency across them so that you have, whether it's the media companies or the publishers, and the agency and the advertiser not pulling their hair out. I agree. Right. And, and I think that's where all the ambition helps, too, because you now have a collaborative conversation with agencies when we're agreeing on currency, we're agreeing on the measurement, and we're agreeing on what is a success for a campaign. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things, getting it back to the programmatic or automated part of it, that's a benefit because it frees up some time to kind of dig deeper into these conversations with the agencies. Yeah, and every time I hear these, you know, we, we hear this a lot, right? So, so every media company is out there with, with different data-driven solutions in the market today, and the pushback that we hear a lot is, well, everyone's building their own walled garden. Right. Yep. It's actually completely flawed. That, that's actually not what's happening at all, right? If you think about the way that the industry operates today, right? Today with Nielsen currency, right? You have data at the top that's consistent. People are agreeing on essentially a Nielsen C3 industry standard. Then at the bottom, you have verified posting coming from a third party. Maybe it's an MSA, you have automated invoicing, all of that. What happens in the middle, the way that we build audience estimates, the way that we steward deals, the way that things are optimized, it's completely different. That's where we compete. That's the same thing that's happening right now. Right? The difference is this data piece is still really wonky, right? And it's really hard to come to, to Julian's team or my team with the same data segment, right? That, that functionally is, is really difficult for an agency to do. That'll start to get cleaned up. But the idea that somebody comes well, to one of us with an NCS segment, that should be turnkey. Or, just that means, well, that's the nail on the head. head. The so, standardization is on the data end of the spectrum. That's right. That's, that's where the standardization has to be. Data and technology. Data Correct. Data environment currency. is a world garden. I mean, it has been networked well world gardens. Right? Sure, there was a currency, and there were people buying, but what happened inside was very much opaque. And it always, right, so, so for those of you who don't understand the way that, that TV inventory works, and I'm assuming many of you do, but TV inventory is really, really complicated, right? It is a giant jigsaw puzzle. Right. I, I'm, I'm a new TV guy. I've only been at Turner for five years. Before that, I had very little experience. But the, the insights that I have gained in the last five years learning about how TV inventory interacts with itself, it is a giant fucking jigsaw puzzle. It is massive. The notion that I can take part of that inventory, <laughs> the, the idea of taking some of that inventory out and putting it over here and doing something special and then trying to put it back in doesn't work, right? You have competitive separation. You have do not air lists. The inventory only works so many ways. You have how many different distribution outlets? You have, like so for CNN, we have north of 70 different distribution touch points for that, for, for that asset. That's extremely complicated, right? We can't decision those things separately. So to some extent, that decisioning will always, to some extent, have to be a walled garden. Unless we want to start to give up on all the rules, right? So the idea that, hey, day parts don't exist. You can air me wherever you want. There is no such thing as competitive separation. I don't have a do not air list, right? You can't have that both ways. Because the inventory is interdependent once you start to do those things. But it so, works for a national and local. So why can't, why can't there be a national, local, and a data? Interesting, huh? You mean from a currency perspective? No, from a, that whole inventory. Right, why do we? That, oh. that you're talking about. You can buy yeah. any show you want in a DMA. Yeah, at and, the local yeah. level. And like I've said, we, we've always been open to that, and we are, right? So today in Solutions Today, we place units literally at the 30-minute level for our advanced solutions. The challenge is, when we do that, we get pushed back very quickly from the agency saying, oh, well, I still need all my competitive separation. I Correct. can't air here, I can't air there, I can't do this. Okay. Right. right? The only way for me to do that is to be decisioning all that inventory together. You know, when, when, That's when, the challenge. when programmatic first started, right, well, for better or for worse, in the digital world, it was, you know, remnant inventory, and it was you know, placing it wherever because it meet the audience and there were lots of kind of wild, wild west scenarios that are now obviously closed up in a lot of levels. Well, you, know, you don't have that scenario on TV, but you do have, as Dan said, 70 different distribution points, uh, different standards for which and how you're delivering it. What you're delivering in OTT is not what you're delivering on right. live broadcast and so on and so forth. So you know, just that level of complexity, you know, decisioning on that in real time with a data set across all of those outlets is not, as you know, 
right? Not a simple execution on any broadcaster's end. Well, but there's two areas of standardization that need to take place though, right? It is, it is the foundational data that Dan uses and Jillian uses and, and all these other platforms out there uses so that the agency, when they're doing their cross portfolio optimization, understand what it is they're talking about. Right. The second thing, and that it's apples to apples. The second thing is around targets, right? So the definition of an auto intender for, for network group A and network group B may be two different things. They may be defined by two different people and it's not necessarily an apples to apples. So that target that the agency uses, <coughs> that OMG uses, needs to be available within some sort of platform Correct. for these guys to be able to, to talk about it across the board. And the third thing I'll raise, which I think has not really been talked about a lot, is being able to understand the quality of that target, right? So when you look at, when you look at a lot of the data that's out there, um, there's a lot of questions sometimes like, well, this is an auto intender. Well, we just take it for granted that's an auto intender, sure. right? It's, 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 there's going to be a verification at some point of the value of that target as, yes, this is an auto to, intended. To some degree, it's like they do with digital. <clears throat> to some degree, that's the responsibility of the buying entity. To make to sure. Vet, to vet On the, the agency the, side, the, for sure. Right? I mean, look, I'll tell you, I do the same thing. I, I have to vet if I'm using third party and not first party. I'm vetting the quality of, of that, that third data. Part, of course. Right. Uh, so that's, you know, but to your point, and I think Dan, we're, we're saying the same thing, um, you do need a, some, a, a whole host of standardization on data so that when you're taking, when an agency takes a data set and they're taking it to Turner, to Viacom, to NBCU, to CBS, wherever, it's the same. Everybody's speaking that same language. Right. If you don't have everybody speaking the same language just on the data set, you, create a lot of work, you, right. you just create, not only do you create work, I think, you, I think it, it's not Usually. for the benefit of the client. Yeah. Right. So the client's talking, losing out. So you're talking about the, the TV version of a cookie. Uh, well, not so not necessarily a persistent ID that's tracking. Yeah. Somebody. Just uh, again, it, just the standardization of what defines the data. Like, like a dictionary, that starts to commonly define things this way. When when an, when, an, when an agency and advertiser went to Julian and said, "Hey, I want to define this this way," and when they come to us and we want to define it different ways, right? Remember, in the TV space, you have two data's right now in two different buckets. You have attitudinal behavioral, right, and then you have the viewership data. Right now, you have, I would say, sort of three big players in the viewership space, right? Chris and, and the folks at Comscore being one of them, Nielsen, TiVo, um, uh, two additional ones. But there's a host of, uh, of other ones, right? There's lots, every, everybody who owns TV data is selling it now, right? Whether you're a set-top box owner, ACR vendor. So you have that viewership data. Then you have attitudinal behavioral data, right? This could be psychographic survey information, could be auto registration data, frequent shopper card, and that data needs to be integrated, right? Well, so and I think to jo Joan's point, though, one of the things that's really critically important is you can't confuse analytics with currency. Right. Very, very different. Yeah. Right? Yep, totally. Because because I think Joan raised this earlier on the panel where it's like, well, you know, being, because I have this information and I can do this analysis, that doesn't make it currency from a representative perspective. And for this kind of transaction on the TV side, that's that's critically important. And I think the other thing that hasn't been brought up, which I think is, is key, is how does that change based on the content that you're looking at? So linear content, I'll, I'm going to use this term loosely. Linear content cross-platform, right? And it's not linear when it goes cross-platform, but platform agnostic delivered linear content. The way that information will be, or way, the, the way that will be measured and looked at may be very different than the way digital is looked at from a clip standpoint, sure. right? And it's, so it's being able to isolate those different groups. And ultimately, I, I suppose it can all come together from a cross-media optimization perspective, looking at touch points. But... The, but I suspect that cross-platform linear data will follow whether it's, you know, I would use the term exact commercial exposure for three day and seven day versus average commercial exposure. But nonetheless, it'll probably follow those kind of traditional TV metrics and digital will come into that, in that window, that three day, seven day window, will start to all kind of pull together and outside that eight day window, it may be a very different scenario. Uh, I, and I think the standardization is important also just so agencies then replicate it. I mean, that's ultimately their goal. It's a successful campaign. How do we do it again? And how do you do it again with a company that might be a little bit disparate to who sure. they're currently working with? Let me ask a question to Steve. So if you're working for a day, I mean, these guys have a very specific vision of how the world should work. What would you do if you're working for a, world, for a day? Yeah, I, I disagree. Yeah, pen and a piece there. of paper, and we'll write this down. <laughs> no, we, we're, so we're, we're, we're talking about <coughs> the currency, right? And, and it's not the currency and the data in terms of of consistency, I think there's there's two different things, and we're we're combining them, which is currency and value, right? So so we talk about a consistent 
form of currency, right? And that currently would be the answer over in the digital space, right? So yeah, we pay on, on DCM numbers, right? Because that's, that's the source of truth. But we look at different things to determine the value of that buy, right? So we look at viewability, we look at on target percentage, mm -hmm. we look at DMP data, we look at performance, we look at all those things and, and we're paying a $10 CPM, let's say, to, to five publishers, but they're not all delivering a $10 CPM worth of value. Now it's up to us on our side to determine who's delivering the best value, go back to the ones that aren't and say, mm, viewability, not so hot, either get it up or you're off the buy. And then we get them off Is the buy. Is DCM giving you your viewability? Or are you no, getting it from somebody it's else? Different, it's different vendors. So but, then, but we but pay we pay on DCM. So you're talking about the currency, right? The currency is gross impressions, right? And you, you can negotiate a viewable guaranteed buy, but they're basically just jacking up your CPM in order to account for what's not going to be viewable, right? So we, we all know that at this point. So you're, you're paying at this, but we call it valuable impressions, right? You know, really innovative term. What, what percent of those impressions are valuable? However, we define value for that particular client. And then that's the way ultimately we optimize and we evaluate the buy. We, we still have to pay here because that's, that's just the rules of the game, right? So I think in, in this space, there, you know, right now it's, it's the Nielsen TRP, right? That's the value, that's the, you know, the currency, that's the rule of the game. But now what we're seeing with the new data sets is there's more ways to look at the value. And now we can say Big Bang is more valuable than two and a half men, you know, whatever it might be, because they've got more of our real audience, right? They're still delivering the same number of TRPs against adults 25 to 54, but now we know because of these other data sets, one more, one's more valuable than the other. So it's not about the currency of what we're paying, it's about the value of what we're getting. So Stephen, I, I think, so everything you said makes, makes a ton of sense and it, and it gets back to that idea in my mind of, of precision, right? And what we want to do is, we actually want the currency to be those things you care about. And we want to create the precision so that you can really, really precisely manipulate those things, right? So it's not just about audience. To your point, it's a slew of other things, right? So it could be who you talk to. It could be the frequency. It could be when you talk to them. It could be the content or context with which you talk to them. Uh, it could be the actual platform itself, right? A TV screen versus a phone versus... For, so all of these things, right? And we kind of view these as levers. We view it sort of as our job to create the best precisions so that you can very precisely manipulate those pieces and then we build a business model on it so that you pay us when those levers are pulled the right way and you get the effect that you want. I, I That's think, what we want programmatic I, to enable. I think it would Great. be very tough to, to operate in a model where you're leveraging data to get to the precision that Dan's talking about, and then you're tracking back to a general high-level GRP. Oh, well, I didn't say it was pay. easy. That's, that, that's actually, I, get it. I personally think that's wrong, uh, both as a buyer and a seller, frankly. Uh, right. I just, well, at this point, it's not about GRP anymore. Yeah. Right. But I'm just saying, like, but there is you know, something we're paying for. The challenge that's is very good. Like I said, that, that, that makes sense. <laughs> Again, right? you know. I mean, well, that's the thing, too. That brings up the whole concept of result measurement, right? Because it's really at the, at the you know, we're at a point in time now where result measurement is scalable, right? And, and it's not all the way there yet, but it's getting pretty close to where you have the ability. You certainly can do it in, t in digital and have been for a while. Uh, you're at a point now where you can do it in TV, where you can look at people exposed to ads and to be able to measure the, expo the, the result of that exposure to those ads in their behavior, right? Versus it just being a GRP or, or uh, impressions delivered. So, I mean, then the question becomes, does that, how does that change the thinking around well, I, I think, I think yeah. Steve's point is correct in that the currency, like what the trade, if you will, really does have to get simplified. Like it can't be 15 right. measures of something to get to the currency. Right. Mm -hmm. Your ability to delineate what is actually of quality and what you want to continue to invest in, that's absolutely measurement, right? Mm -hmm. And that's analytics. And then you will make those decisions conscious of everything that you're getting back. The key is right. for you exactly. to be getting back apples to apples data for you to be able to make those cross-platform decisions on how you're ultimately dis uh, determining what's inventory. working across all inventory channels. But, right. but so, last question for everybody in the panel. I want to go from the end, from Jeff forward. Sure. Uh, what is your vision for TV five years out, let's say? Wow, got a, got a magic crystal ball in front of me, huh? Um, you know, what's, what's the definition of TV? Like, and I think that's the first thing we have to start with. Um, from Audience Express, what do you think yeah. uh, the business from yeah. Comcast Audience Express? How, what I would hope our company is, is involved in is, uh, currently we're in uh, linear cable with direct connect to our inventory partners. I would hope that we are in different buckets of inventory um, that are still a direct connect using the technology that we have. 
um, and enabling us to get next day reporting and some other stuff that we're able to do. Um, but you know, five years isn't that far away. You know, as we keep talking about you know, evolution and revolution, and um, you know, these things take time, but uh, you know, that would be my hope that you know, we're definitely into cross-platform and uh, you know, an ability to, to sell it to the marketplace. More addressability capabilities? Excuse me? More addressability capabilities? Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question for this space. So if you asked about 20 years, I think we could all put on our futurist hats and say, you know what that might look like, but you know, to your point, five years is just not that far off. Um, I think I think we're probably still here having a lot of these same discussions. Unfortunately, um, it's going to move slowly again. There's there's so much at stake in the billions of dollars that are transacted the old way that there's there's so much inertia about making this change. And, and uh, you know, we kind of spoke on the panel. The, the dollars follow the eyeballs, and the eyeballs are certainly heading in a certain direction with with over the top and. You know, shout out to Hulu, who's in the crowd, right? You know, we, we haven't even, you know, talked about that uh, to, to a large degree. Um, that's going to take more and more of, of, of the dollars, and, and ultimately, as that business model proves itself out, um, you know, I think the more traditional guys will come probably kicking and screaming to some extent. Um, streaming will continue to grow. It's still not going to be the primary source of consumption. You don't think years. streaming is going to be a tipping point? Because I don't think in five years. Because, I mean, it's two things, right? One is consumers consuming more, and then the other tipping point can be somebody like Comcast saying, you know, to help with set-top boxes. You get a little Roku, and you IP everything to, through that box. Yeah, they still, they still control the pipes, and controlling the pipes is really powerful. Right, and, and in terms of being this new streaming audience more affluent and more technologically desirable for, for advertisers? It, it is. I'm, I'm not sure that's going to continue, right? I mean, I don't want to say everybody has cable, but everybody has cable um, to some extent. You know, you'd have cable before you put food on the table in some places, right? Because, you, you know, you got to watch sports on Sunday, you know, whatever that looks like. So, um, it, yes, it's certainly a more desirable audience. I'm not sure that that's ultimately going to continue because you still need mass. Thank you. Chris, what do you think? I, yes, I mean, so for us, this is kind of an easy question, and we spent a lot of time thinking about this, right? So if, if you define TV as, as traditional television linear content, which I'm, I'm assuming that's how we're defining TV, um, it's cross-platform, it's linear content measured, at least from a measurement standpoint, measured platform agnostic across all devices in a way that is audience-based versus age, sex, demography, um, and um, uh, you know is 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 done in such a way that you can measure unduplicated audience. Which I mean, it sounds like such a researchy term to bring up, I suppose, here. But it is so so critical. You cannot stack audiences, right? You can't say, here's my linear audience, here's my VOD audience, here's my DVR audience, here's my yeah. tablet audience, and be able to understand really the impact of that exposure when it comes to reach and frequency and all these other things. Which is why scale is so important which is why this is really hard to do because it's a very fragmented world and you've got to be able to measure all those things. I, you know, at least from Comscore's perspective, whether, you know, we'll see how the adoption plays out to Steve's point, but those tools will be available sooner rather than later. It's not going to be five years before that kind of service, those types of, that type of information is available in the marketplace. Julian. So I want to qualify. The question is, is what is Viacom's vision or what is my vision? <laughs> I advise you to this. Because they're not the same. Knowing I'm just curious. I want to know your vision. Uh, I think my vision is similar to Chris's in to the extent that you have an ability to measure effectively content um, consumption across all platforms. And yes, I'm trying to align them. Um, you know, across all platforms, uh, which allows you know, content distributors, content creators, uh, to actually get the, the value out of everything they're doing and the value of the audience that they're bringing to the table. So I, personally, I, I think that there's a tipping point in 2020, uh, which has a very big impact on how the future of the TV... Why, why 2020? Because uh, I think the NFL deals up for a renegotiation in 2020. And I think that is a massive, regardless of slight ratings down or whatever it is, that is a massive tipping point for how TV works. Because if you look at... Ultimately, you know, uh, my son, who's a 10-year-old, you know, he doesn't watch TV on a clock, right? There's no concept of that in his life, and there will never be a concept of that in his life. He doesn't tune in at 8 o'clock to watch a show because it's just not how it works for him. 
but he does watch the show, right? Now, it might be an hour later on DVR, it might be two days later on VOD, hopefully in that C3 window so we get paid. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he's doing that, and then, you know, this, there's an entire generation that's growing up that way, and it's, it's imperative for us to have a more uh, capable measurement infrastructure and, and, and for the ecosystem to trade uh, effectively on the value of the audience across all platforms. So my vision would be, A, for the measurement to be uh, effective and for the content providers to be paid uh, equitably for the audience that they're bringing to the table for the quality of content that they're putting out. Thank you very much. Dan? So I, a couple of things. So, so I think from, from user experience, you will see um, technology completely change the way that people start to interact with TV. And that will happen in five years, um, w without a doubt. I think um, a much, much bigger push towards addressability will start to happen. It's certainly not going to be at full scale by you know, in, in five years. But you will, every year, you'll start to see the inventory tick up a little bit. And I think you'll also start to see the business model change in terms of how we start to leverage that. And where I would go with that from, from an ad model standpoint is I come back to the precision in those, those six levers, right? So it's, in our mind, it's about leveraging technology, data, and analytics to better enable optimization, but to do it at a granular level, right? If, if you still have to buy big, broad day parts, it doesn't matter if you can measure the audience because you're buying a daytime rotator that's 6A to 3P Monday through Friday. You can't take advantage of the data. Right? So the idea of getting more precision there, the, idea, I, the ability to do frequency capping. You know, unduplicated reach, Chris, is, is an extremely important, um, extremely important thing to be able to measure, but it's even more important to be able to activate against. Right? You ha now you have to measure first so that you know how to change it, but if you don't have the precision so that you can better source and you can ultimately better place an impression this way, you, you know, first one here, second one here, that, those things are all important. You know, at the end of the day, we, we see that ecosystem, right? Those, those six levers creating a, a ton of precision there to better enable effective advertising, but frankly, to create a better consumer experience with advertising. Because the thing that we've all danced around but haven't really spoke about is, right now, the consumer experience with advertising is not good. It has to be fixed. Um, and I think through technology, data, and analytics, I think we can do that, and I think we are doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.